I want to start this morning uh, with a question, uh, and I'm addressing this to, to Christians, to those of you who've trusted Christ. Since, since you became a Christian and came to Jesus, placed your faith in Him as Lord and Savior, have you ever doubted Him? Uh, you, you're, in other words, your experience has been in the past where you were searching for peace, searching for meaning in life, and you were finally led to the Lord Jesus, and you saw him as the end of the search for meaning in life. You, you placed your faith and trust in him. He's the answer to what life is all about. You saw it as clear as the noonday sun. You've even proclaimed him as the answer to other people. But since then, or perhaps even now, you're, you're, you're not sure. There have been clouds of, of doubt that have rolled in. Uh, you're perplexed, uh, confused concerning something which at one point was so crystal clear. And my question this morning is, why do such doubts occur? And what am I as a Christian supposed to do with my doubts? And how does Jesus deal with my doubts? And, and, and how do these doubts affect my relationship with Christ? How, how does he feel about me? when I'm doubting. If you can identify with any of those feelings of doubt in your relationship with Jesus or have similar questions, I believe there's direction, there's encouragement, there's affirmation for you today as a follower of Christ. You see, Luke chapter 7 deals with a man who went through a similar experience, and his name is John the Baptist. There was a time when he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ was the answer. Uh, he, he proclaimed that Jesus is the answer. He's the one who said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the one who said, he's so much the answer that he must increase and I must decrease. He, John stood at one point in the sunshine of assurance that Jesus Christ is the answer. And yet, when we come to Luke chapter 7, we meet John not under the sunshine, but under the, the darkness of the clouds of doubt. We find John the Baptist doubting the Lord Jesus. And then we see in this passage Jesus dealing with John's doubts. And there, there's some wonderful instruction here concerning the whole subject of Christian doubts. And what we're going to do is look at dealing with doubts this morning under four headings, doubts anxiety in verses 18 and 19, Doubts appeal in verses 19 and 20. Doubts answer in verses 21 through 23. And then doubts acceptance in verses 24 through 28. So let's, let's look first at doubts anxiety. In verses 18 and 19, it says, And the disciples of John reported to him about all these things that, that Jesus was doing. And summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or, or do, we, do we look for someone else? And, and what we see in this verse is, is an expression of what was a deeply rooted mindset among the Jews in the first century. They were, they were looking for an expected one. They, there was an extremely strong messianic expectation. The, the Jews of the first century were looking for a coming one, a, a coming Messiah, a deliverer who was promised. There, there was just this innate longing in their hearts for Messiah. They, they were looking for one who would come and make right all of life's wrongs. And there was so much wrong going on all around them. They were looking for one who would come and put down sinful rulers and authorities, one who would establish his own righteous rule on the earth. They, they, they were looking for someone to come who was worthy of their worship, uh, someone to give their lives to. They were looking for someone who was the answer to, to meaning in life, who, someone who could solve the problem of sin. And, and I believe that there's a sense in which all of us are, are searching for the answer to life. Uh, the equation of life gets, gets pretty complicated sometimes. There's so many terms and variables, and we all want to know what it equals to. And after you search and search and search, and it doesn't all seem to add up, people, people lose hope. 
And I think we're living in that day, folks, where people are losing hope because they can't figure the answer. And that's what's led to a rash of suicides in recent weeks. Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain. Uh, what is life's answer? What does it all mean? What is the truth? What is the way that I'm to walk? Jesus gives a simple answer in John 14, verse 6. He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I am the answer to life. And John the Baptist had figured that out. I mean, John the Baptist uh, believed that Jesus was the end of the search, that he was God's answer to meaning in life. But something happened in his life that caused him to doubt. And we see the expression of his anxiety in, in verse 19. Are, are you really the coming one? Or, or, or do we look for someone else? John was doubting, and have you ever been in the place, folks? I mean, just where you've ever doubted Jesus Christ? What causes us to doubt that he's the answer? Well, I, I think what causes us to doubt is the very same thing that caused John to doubt. And let's, let's look at an explanation of his doubts. To, to understand... John's doubts, we, we have to understand where John was in Luke chapter 7. Where was he uh, geographically at this point in the life and ministry of Jesus? What were his circumstances? There's a parallel passage to this, uh, Luke 7 and Matthew 11. And here's what Matthew 11, 2 says. Now when John, while imprisoned heard the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? Folks, John was in jail when Luke chapter 7 was written. A man named Ironsides explains the historical background. He said, during the early part of our blessed Lord's ministry, John the Baptist was arrested by order of King Herod because of his faithfulness in seeking to press upon the conscience of that wicked monarch his vileness and corruption, particularly in connection with his adulterous relationship with his brother's wife, Herodias. Herod, King Herod had committed adultery with his brother's wife, and John confronted him with it. And then he was put into jail. And in Luke chapter 7, he is languishing in prison, sometime deep into the imprisonment of John the Baptist. He goes on to say, he who, who had been used to speak to thousands, John the Baptist, who had presented the Lord Jesus as the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, now seemed to be neglected and forgotten. Doubtless, there would come to him from time to time rumors of the great miracles that Jesus did and reports of his discourses, his sermons, but there was nothing to actually indicate that he was presenting himself to Israel as the expected one, the Messiah. Warren Wiersbe said of John's imprisonment, it must have been difficult for this man, accustomed to a wilderness life, to be confined to a prison. The physical and emotional strain were no doubt great, and long days of waiting didn't make it any easier. The Jewish leaders failed to intercede for John, and it seemed to him as if Jesus was just doing nothing for him. Uh, Isaiah 61 and verse 1 is a prediction of the ministry that Messiah would have when he came to the earth. And it said, when Messiah comes, he would proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. And I can tell you, John knew that scripture. And he must have thought, if Jesus came to set prisoners free, I'm a pretty good candidate. But what happened with John, he probably had slipped into the thinking of, and the mindset of the people of the Jews who wanted a Messiah to come and defeat the Romans, a Messiah who they could crown king. That's, that's surely what his, Jesus' disciples wanted all the way deep into their ministry. They wanted Jesus to become king right now. They did not understand that Messiah had to go to a cross before he could wear a crown and establish his kingdom. His kingdom, 
The kingdom of the Lord Jesus, folks, primarily is a kingdom of the heart, and there is only one way that a heart can be conquered, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ, a holy God, a ho the holy Son of God dying for your sins and my sins. But, but all of that to say, here was the real problem. According to John's mind, Jesus was not acting like he thought Messiah would act. He must have thought, surely at some point, Jesus is going to break me out of this prison. He, he, he's, Jesus was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. And so, so what is the explanation for doubts? I think the bottom line is this, that the clouds of doubt form over our hearts when Jesus acts in ways that we don't expect him to or when we think he should act and he does nothing. John's circumstances had him in a prison and perhaps he figured, as I said, John would set him free, but he didn't. And John, in the midst of those circumstances, was clouded with doubt. And let's, let me ask you, is that the reason for your doubts? Jesus is not acting like you thought he would. I think this is most often the source of doubts in my own life. I have experienced some incredible clouds of doubt as a Christian uh, over a number of years, in the past years, uh, and recently. You know, I think of what has just happened in our congregation uh, with, with Lewis, and, and I'm just going, what is going on, Lord, here in this situation? I, 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 think, I think that doubts, uh, you know, you know we, we have the, this, this prison-like circumstance that we think by now Jesus would surely have done something, but, but you're still in prison, and the question arises, is he really the, the one? Or do I look for someone or something else? Jesus, are you the one? You just did this. Are you really the one? And, and uh, folks, you mark this down. Doubts arise because Jesus breaks out of the boundaries that we've set for him in our minds. We can't control Jesus. Do I hear an amen? The boundaries that we set for him in our minds are never safe. There's a tremendous picture of this aspect of Jesus in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. How many of you have read any of the Chronicles? A number of you have. Uh, in the series, Lewis portrays the Lord Jesus as a lion named Aslan. And the first book of a, I think it's a seven-book series, concerns the search of some young children for Aslan, Edmund, Susan, and Lucy. And they're led on their search for Aslan by a beaver who knows all about Aslan. And Mr. Beaver starts by quoting a well-known poem about Aslan. Here he says, Wrong will be right when Aslan is in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, it will be spring again. You'll understand him when you see him, Mr. Beaver said. But, but shall we see him, asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve, that's why I brought you here. I'm to lead you to where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Well, is, is, he, is he a man? Is he just a man? Aslan a man, said Mr. Beaver. Certainly not. I tell you, he's the king of the wood. He's the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beast? Aslan, the lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I, I, I thought he was just a man. Is, is he quite safe? I, I shall feel rather, rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, my dear. Make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Then, then, then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He isn't safe, but he is good. He is the king, and you can't tame him. 
Now understand, folks, Jesus isn't safe. He's probably not going to stay in the boundaries that, that you've set for him. You can't control him. He is sovereign. He is powerful. And he will do what he will do. He is not safe, but he's good. And he's the king. And it's when, I really think it's when he breaks out of those boundaries that we've set for him in our minds that, that the doubts begin to come. Now, what do you do when they come? What do you do with doubts? Maybe you're in prison right now. Maybe there's someone here today who's really doubting the Lord Jesus. Your doubts are real, but what do you do with them? I'm so thankful the story of John the Baptist is here because he becomes the model for us of what to do with our doubts. Uh, doubts appeal in verse 19, and the disciples of John reported to him about all these things. And summoning two of his disciples, here's what we do. John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? The answer of what to do with our doubts is to package them up and send them straight to Jesus. This is the instruction for the doubter. Send your doubts to the Lord. You know, we need to understand, folks, too, this. Our doubts are not always wrong. Would you look at that quote in your outline? Warren Wiersbe explains what doubts are. He says, there is a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is a matter of the mind. We, we cannot understand what God is doing or why he's doing it. Unbelief is a matter of the will. We refuse to believe God's word and obey what he tells us to do. In John's case, his inquiry was not born out of willful unbelief, but doubt that was nourished by great physical and emotional strain. And I believe that, that clouds of doubt are, are designed by the Lord to, to draw us to prayer and into fellowship with him as we lay our doubts at his feet. Let's look now at doubt's answer in verses 20 through 23. How, and, and the question here is, how does Jesus handle our doubts when he receives them from us? There, there's some wonderful instruction here. It says, and when the men had come to him, John's guys had come to Jesus. They said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? And at that very time, he, Jesus, cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many who were blind, and he answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And tell him this, blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Now, the first thing I want you to notice about Jesus' answer to John is that it is not immediate. Doubt's answer is delayed. There's a delay here. John, John's disciples ask the question in verse 20, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? And then there's a delay because uh, Jesus answers the question in verses 22 and 23, but he doesn't answer it immediately. They will have to wait, and John will have to wait to receive the answer to his doubts. Is Jesus really the answer? You say, well, what happens between verse 20 and verses 22 and 23? This is really profound, verse 21, okay? That's what happens, and notice what happens. It said, well, let me read verse 20 again. And when the man came to him, they said, John the Baptist is saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? Here's verse 21. It says, and at that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many who were blind. Now, there are two key words there, the word time and the word many. At that very time, he cured many people. Before Jesus would send the answer to John, he was going to take some time, and he took a lot of time. It was a significant delay. We don't know how long it was. 
because Jesus was doing a lot. I mean, what, what was Jesus doing while John was sitting under those clouds of doubt? It, it says here he was curing many people. Uh, he was working. He, he essentially said to John's boys, he said, guys, hold on. I've got some work to do first before I answer your question." He was working in the lives of, of men and women. And, and what was he doing? He was amassing evidence, testimony, that he would eventually send to John. He was fulfilling the prophetic word about the Messiah. He was doing everything that the Old Testament said Messiah would be doing. He was casting out evil spirits, healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, raising the dead, doing all that Messiah would do. And it's only after he amasses all of this evidence that he answers the question of, to John's disciples. He says in verse 22, and he answered and said to them, it's almost as though he's saying, now, now go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. John's disciples must have seen, seen Jesus do all of that because he says to them, I want you to, to report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. And I think that verse 21 took a lot of time. It took more than hours. It could have taken days. And so, so Jesus answers, eventually answers John's question, but only after a significant delay. And, and here's my question. Why did John have to wait for the answer? And, and let's make it more, even more personal to us. Uh, why, do, why does God allow the doubt, clouds of doubt to linger over my life? I mean, there are times by God's design when I must live under clouds of doubt, and to what end or what purpose are the doubts there? And I'll tell you this, what God is doing, God is building faith. He is, he is tearing down the boundaries that we've built in our minds, the box that we built in our mind for Jesus to keep him confined. He's changing the boundaries in your mind so that he has more freedom to roam in your life. He's expanding our vision of him during the delay. He's building greater trust in our heart. Even when we don't understand what he's doing. Folks, it is so huge to trust God when you don't understand what he's doing. Do I hear an amen? Because, you know, folks, here's the glory of this book. There will be a day when we do understand. That there will be a day when there will be no clouds. It'll only be sunshine in our relationship with Jesus. And you say, when will that day come? It will come when we see him face to face. It will come in heaven. It will all make sense. Everything that's happened to us over here in the last month, the last few weeks, every, everything that has happened will all make sense because I've learned of heaven in Revelation 21. There's no crying. There's no mourning. There's no pain. It will all come together. It will all make sense. And so, so the question for us is, will we trust him when we do not see him working, or, or will we go looking for other answers? When, when the clouds roll in, uh, what, what are we going to do? I, I want you to look at the uh, last part of Jesus' answer here in verse 23. It comes in the, in the form of a beatitude. And a beatitude is a blessing. Here, here's what a beatitude is. If thus and such is true in your life, you'll be blessed. You will be happy. And at the end of verse, at verse 23, Jesus says, And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. The whole imagery here is of a man who's searching for meaning in life, a man is hunting for life's answer to the truth. And what Jesus says is, blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. He, he's saying, John, don't look for anybody else. I am the expected one. I'm the end of the search. You found me, you found it. 
don't keep looking, don't stumble over me, you set up camp right here, I'm the rock, you stay here, you stay focused on me, you will not be disappointed, you'll receive blessing upon blessing if you stay focused on me. And I believe this is Jesus' message throughout the entire New Testament, he proclaimed it through his ministry, I am the end of the search. You've got inner hunger, I'm the bread of life. You're thirsty on the inside, I am living water. You need direction. I'm the good shepherd. You need forgiveness. You can stop right here at me. I'm the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You need wisdom. I'm the light of the world. This is Jesus' message to us, folks. I am the end of the search. Now, let me, let me ask you this morning, and only you can answer this, is Jesus Christ the end of the search in your life? Have you stopped at the rock or have you stumbled over the locker, rock? Are you still looking for something other than Jesus? Uh, you know, a job, money, relationships, a sport, a hobby, alcohol, drugs. Jesus' answer to John's doubts ultimately was this. I am the expected one. Keep trusting me and you'll be blessed. And all that Jesus was doing during the delay, he was working. He's working when we don't see him working. When we ultimately see what he's doing, folks, one day it'll all make sense. And so, so the, the question, I really think the question for all of us is this. Will we trust him when we do not see him working? Or will we keep going to look for others for answers? Blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is believing when you don't see it. Faith is believing, trusting when you don't understand it. God's word to us and his word to John was, John, I'm the end of the search. Keep trusting me. Now, one, one final aspect of this dealing with doubts. How, how do you think the Lord feels about you when you're, you're doubting Him, when you're living under these clouds of doubt? Let me, let me share with you how I feel sometimes when I'm doubting the Lord. I feel pretty lousy. I, I feel worthless when I'm doubting. That's how I feel. I, 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 I reason to myself, how in the world can I doubt someone who's been so good to me? His faithfulness. How can I question? I feel like a jerk. And, and I'm sure that Jesus must feel that I'm a jerk. Wondering why in the world he ever saved me. I, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't see anything good in me. That, that's, you know, when I start having these doubts about Jesus, that, that's how I feel. Well, is that accurate thinking? Is Jesus really against us when we're doubting? I want you to watch this next section quickly. Because it reveals Jesus' heart attitude toward a doubting believer. In Luke 7, 24 through 28, it says, When the messengers of John had left. Now, they, it, they'd been with him for days, probably. They finally leave to go back to take the answer to, to John. It says, Jesus began to speak to the multitudes about John. And he said, What did you go out in the wilderness to, to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? Did, did, did you go out there to see somebody who was politically correct or someone who had convictions? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. Did you go out to see someone who was focused on himself, who was in the ministry for the money and the perks? Or did you go out to see someone who is more concerned about God and his glory and your good? But, but what, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, <laughs> there's no one greater than John. Now, now, I want you to notice here that John's messengers had left. J John is, is back in the prison living under these clouds of doubt, it would be some time before the messengers arrive. And immediately after the messengers leave, Jesus turns to the crowd and he says to them, let, let, me, let me tell you about John. I can't believe this guy. 
you know, he's had more light and more privilege than any Old Testament prophet. You know, we, we gave him, say, how in the world could he ever doubt me? I, I, you know, I may talk this over with my father, and I'm seriously thinking of dropping him out of prophet status. How embarrassing for the forerunner to have doubts. Is that what Jesus said about the believing doubter? A believing doubter is one who has stopped his search at Christ. He's left everything to stay and to, you know, to follow Christ, but he, he has doubts and he has questions. And this is what Jesus says about John, the believing doubter. He says, hey crowd, let me tell you about my servant John. Is he a man of character? He's, he's got convictions. He's not politically correct. He's no reed blown about by the wind. He's not a compromiser. He, he, did, he doesn't sacrifice his convictions for soft clothing in king's palaces. John is a great prophet. He's more than a prophet. In fact, of all those born of women, and that includes all of us, everybody, there's been nobody greater than John. I love this guy. What is John's condition as Jesus is giving this speech to the crowd? He is, um, he is in prison-like circumstances under a cloud of doubt, wondering if Jesus is the answer. He, he hasn't stumbled over the rock. He's staying at the rock, but he's questioning. He's sure questioning. And during this time, Jesus is loving him. He's praising him. He's accepting him. And I believe that Jesus feels the same way about us when, when we doubt. Because you know what? Jesus knows our hearts. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, Lord, I want to, to trust. Help me. And, and he was all in for John, and he is all in for you and me, even when we doubt. So we're uh, at the end here. Um, what have we learned today? If you're a believer, uh, what have we said about doubts? They are caused when Jesus acts in ways that are unexpected. And you, folks, you can expect him to do the unexpected, amen? When, when he breaks down the boundaries that we have set for our minds, that's what will cause the doubts. And the purpose of the doubts is to build faith, to change our boundaries, to stretch them, to draw us into fellowship with Jesus, to send our doubts to him. That's what we should do. What do we do when we have doubts? We send them to Jesus. They, 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 they cause us to fellowship more with Jesus, and he, he wants to spend time with us. And how does Jesus answer my doubts? Most likely by waiting and working. Usually waiting, but always working to prove to me eventually that he is the answer. And, and his message to the doubter is this, I am the answer. You don't have to look further. Please do not stumble over me. Trust me. I will prove myself in the end. And how does he feel about you when you're doubting? Oh, he loves you. He accepts you. I mean, he knows who you are. I think... Um, if you're here today and maybe you're clouded with doubt, there are three decisions that, that you should likely make. Number one, you need to decide to send your doubts to Jesus. If you've just been hanging on to them, mulling them around, send them to Jesus in prayer. You need to decide, you need to choose to be willing to let him change the boundaries in your life. He's bigger than you think he is. And then decide, you know, make a recommitment, an irrevocable commitment. I am stopping at the rock. I am not stumbling over the rock. I'm staying right here. I'm not going anywhere. And can I just say a final word? If you're here this morning as an unbeliever and you're still searching for the answer, uh, you, you have to know what the ultimate question is, right? The ultimate question is, where am I going to spend eternity? What, what's going to happen when I die? Uh, can I go to a heaven? Is there a heaven when I die? And folks, the, the only way to go to heaven is to have your sins forgiven. And the only way to have your sins forgiven is through the cross of Jesus Christ, where he took 
what he did not deserve so that he could give us what we don't deserve. Jesus took our hell so that we could have his heaven. Jesus loved us so much, folks, that he literally went to hell for us so he wouldn't have to live in heaven without us. Jesus is the answer. John 14, 6. I mean, it can't be any clearer than this. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one goes to the Father but through me. I'm the answer. I'm the end of the search. Blessed is the one who keeps from stumbling over me. Would you pray with me? Dear Father and Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word that reveals your heart and your love. And I thank you, Jesus, that, that you are good and your love is great. Lord, we, we confess that you're not safe, but, but we believe that you're good and your love is great, not just when we face triumph, but also when we face tragedy. I thank you, Lord, that you're good when we see it and when we don't. Thank you that your word says that you are causing all things to work together for good to those who have not stumbled over the rock, to those who have stopped the search for life and have found you, who love you, Lord Jesus, and are called according to your purpose. And Lord, um, I want to pray for the believer here who's struggling with doubts that, Lord, we would just trust you. <laughs> and I want to pray for that one who came here today still searching that maybe today would be the end of the search and they would repent of sin and bow their knee to the Lord Jesus and, and believe, Lord, that all of us would believe in our hearts, blessed, how blessed is the one who keeps from stumbling over you. Lord, have your way in each life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, I'd like you to um, take out your connection card for a moment uh, in your bulletin. You can you can tear it off and just fill that out. We'd like to know you're here. And if you have a prayer request, maybe you've been struggling with doubts. If you have a specific prayer request, we will pray for you. If, um, if today is maybe the end of the search in your life, let us know that. And uh, we want to help you walk and grow in your relationship with the Lord. So just take a few moments, uh, fill that out, and then uh, we're going to sing a closing song.